Let us pray. Oh, Lord Jesus. Open our hearts and minds by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit this morning. As this scripture is read, your holy word is read and proclaimed that we may be filled with new life, that we may be filled with the affirmation of your eternal presence with us, that we may come to know you even more completely. Now, Lord God, guide my words. Guide our thoughts. Make us be the people you would have us to be through this time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter, beginning in the 26th verse. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, And this is in the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. God does some pretty amazing things. When you start with creation... But God does amazing things. God does unexpected things. But God also does something else too. I think God seems to create more questions in our minds than we have answers. So let's set the stage here a little bit. First we have the Annunciation, a term to describe the angel Gabriel coming to 12 to 13-year-old Mary, telling her that she found favor with God. Okay, that sounds great. But ringing in her ear, well, I'm not sure you got the wrong, you got the wrong person. Why are you coming to me, Gabriel? I'm broke. I'm a nobody living in the backwash of the Roman Empire. So that was going through her head. Then something else was going through her head too that's that's not part of scripture but part of the tradition of the day where there is a story about another angel that would come to a a woman, a fiancé, if you will, uh, named Tobit. Tobit would come, and when Tobit appeared to the woman, her betrothed, would immediately be killed. And so that was something that was weighing heavy on her mind too. Here's an angel. Now this was Gabriel, not Tobit. But you can see how she could be so perplexed by what was going on. So not only did God's uh, head angel talk to her, but there was all these other stories that were circulating. and, and, And Mary was saying, oh my gosh. Then there was the incarnation. I just figured I'd put those two words out there. Annunciation, incarnation. Or or the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, resulting in the conception within her of Jesus. This Jesus who is fully divine, fully human, Emmanuel, 
God with us. God made flesh. God now being part of humanity. If we today think this is surreal, imagine what Mary was thinking about all this stuff. Imagine she spent the rest of her life thinking, how did this happen? Why did this happen to me? She finds herself pregnant at 13 without a husband in an unforgiving time of our existence. Anyone who was an unwed mother in that time would have been stoned to death. Something else she was considering. But then there are many more questions. She was with child. How did this happen? It didn't happen to her in the way her mother said that it would happen. How could she be pregnant? Nobody's going to believe this. Not Joseph. Not the townspeople, not the priests. Nobody's going to believe her. Why? Why was Mary chosen rather than all the other capable people within the religious world? Why was this Mary? chosen above all the people who knew the word of God backwards and forwards, who, who would have been more capable of accepting this gift from God, why was Mary chosen? So I got to thinking about this a little bit, and I started thinking about all the people that God chose throughout history. God chose Moses. Moses was a murderer. Moses was a deceiver. He deceived the whole family of Pharaoh. Some would say he was a basket case. Like that? Thought that was a good time? And then there was Noah. Now, Noah was a drunk. When, when all the waters receded, the first thing he went to was the vineyard. Found drunk, passed out by his children. Yet God chose no. And then there's David. Now, what can we say about David? David was a peeping David. Remember, watching Bathsheba take a bath, liked her so much, sent her husband to the front line so she, he could be killed, so he could marry Bathsheba. That's David. That's King David. But guess what? God chose King David. Then there's Ezekiel. He was just whacked. I know that's technical talk. Then Jacob was a trickster. He was deceiving everybody. Then fast forward to Paul. Paul murdered Christians. He tortured Christians. That's Paul. Yet Paul was the greatest spokesman of Christian, Christianity and still is today. Now look at Peter. Peter, arrogant Peter. Loved himself more than God, Peter. Denied Jesus three times, Peter. Ran so far away from the cross so he wouldn't be caught, Peter. But guess what? God used Peter. It's amazing the people that God has called that we wouldn't think would be called. I'm sure that the powers that be would never have thought that God would have called Mary, of all people, to be the mother of God, the God carrier. It's a big list. All these people, what they have in common are questionable pasts and a questionable present. But God chose them. And saints, guess what? God has chosen you. 
and God has chosen me. So the next question is why? Why has God chosen us? One of the saints here at church enlightened me to a modern-day Christian apologist by the name of Ravi Zacharias, who would say a question cannot be answered until all the assumptions are posed. That's philosopher speak, is get your ducks in order before you answer a question. And a few thousand years prior to that, Socrates would say this, that a question cannot be totally debated until it leads to its ultimate conclusion. Einstein said the same thing. Einstein said, science can only take us so far. But there's a point that science cannot explain the unexplainable. Therefore, God has to exist. So those who say Einstein was an atheist are wrong. So here are a few assumptions about God. God loves us. You know what? We could go home right now. But I got more to say. God loves us. I have no clue why. For all the stuff that we've gone through, God still loves us. That's an amazing testimony to God's grace. So that's one of the assumptions, that God loves us. We've all been in all kinds of different situations and said dumb things and thought dumb things and all those sorts of things, but God still loves us. Well, here's a few more assumptions. God meets us where we find ourselves, sometimes wallowing. For some reason, I, I latched on to the word wallowing here lately. When I think of wallowing, I think of mud. When we wallow, we get dirty. We get gritty. We get grimy. We have all this stuff. And, 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 and God says, hey, I'll tell you what, you wallowers, I'll come and clean you up. I'm going to catch you, though, in that mud puddle. I'm going to catch you where you live. You see, Jesus was born through Mary. God found Mary where she lives. You see, God, God doesn't want to find us all buttoned up and, and looking good with our Christmas ties on and all that sort of thing. That's all fine and good, but you know what God does? God looks beyond that. God looks beyond our, our facades. God looks beyond our masks. God looks beyond our uncertainties. God looks beyond our frustrations. God looks beyond our questions. God looks beyond all that stuff and enters our lives in those places where oftentimes we live the most. And that's where the healing is needed the most as well. You see, God finds us in the midst of our own circumstances. And that's the miracle of Christmas. That's the miracle, that's the assumption that, that answers the question of why maybe that, that God wants so much for us uh, to be converted, to be redeemed, to be cleaned up, that God meets us uh, behind that mask that sometimes we wear, behind that facade sometimes we wear. Sometimes that, that mask is, a, is feeling like we're, we're insecure or, or we're, we're humbled and all that other stuff and God finds us there and redeems us. That's what happened to Mary. Maybe that's why Mary was chosen in the first place. Life happens. And our life oftentimes is not clean, neat, and tidy. Taught a lot of Bible studies and always bring up with the saints, what would you like to study? Something in the Old Testament? Oh, no. Now, we can't do the Old Testament stuff. That's a drag. 
That's really bad. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of war going on in the Old Testament. There's a lot of violence going on in the Old Testament, right? There's all this stuff going on in the Old Testament. Guess what the Old Testament shows? That's our journey. That's who we are. And God, with all the prophets and all the law, was trying to intersect our lives at that moment. So we see that in the Old Testament. Now we come to God's word made flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ and saying, look, I know where you've been. I know that you're fighting. But I'm going to make it a little bit different. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to offer you my grace. I'm going to offer you my peace. And all you have to do is accept it. All you have to do is turn to me and I will give you a new life, a transformed life. How does that happen? God knows who we are. God finds us. God has our address. And God's not going to stop until we are redeemed. The other assumption it's all about God's grace. We don't deserve God's love, but God gives it to us anyhow. So if God were to come into our lives, now you see where God's coming in. Our deepest, darkest times, our greatest challenges, our greatest insecurities. That's where God finds us and lifts us up and creates us anew. That is what we celebrate. That's what all this stuff is all about. We're all about Jesus. We're all about God, Emmanuel, God in us. That's the celebration, saints. That's the celebration. That we don't have to live wallowing anymore. That we don't have to live in the mud and the dirt and and the grime. Because God is with us. That's what the incarnation is all about. God with us. on the Socrates. We won't be long. We will debate the question to its ultimate conclusion. Well, maybe the ultimate conclusion here is unanswerable questions in the face of our incredibly loving God who gave all so we can have all. God blessing us, blessing upon blessing, even though we don't deserve it, keeps giving it. You know, Mary was an incredible lady. Still hard to believe a 12 or 13 year old girl went through what she went through. Pretty incredible stuff. She took an incredible leap of faith, too, and left her questions behind as she proclaimed and I love this, I think it's the 38th verse I think it's the last verse of the text that we read this morning here I am the servant of the Lord here I am baggage and all here I am isn't that amazing maybe we at this day need to leave some of our questions unanswered and just trust God and the amazing grace that is continually given and being shared with us, especially through the birth of Jesus. This season's awfully important, incredibly important. It's all about God's giving and us receiving. Bottom line is, too, it's okay to question God. It's okay to be mad at God. If you need permission for that, 
I'll give it. Just read the Psalms. And you'll hear some anger at God. It's okay not to have the answers we are seeking, but to know that God is in the midst no matter what. The miracle that's described here is the ultimate conclusion. And that is what Christmas represents. All we can say about how and why Jesus was born is maybe all summed up in Thomas. Remember Thomas in the Gospel of John? Remember Thomas at the resurrection? I know I'm jumping ahead to April 10th. But uh, remember, remember the Easter, the, re the resurrection story that Thomas uh, said, hey, you know, you all saw Jesus. I didn't see Jesus. And it's not until I see the hands in his, or <laughs> the hands in his hole, the hole in his hands and in his side will I believe. And then Jesus came and stood before the doubting Thomas and said, okay, Thomas, put your hand in the hole right here and in my side. And Thomas' response was, my Lord and my God. So maybe that's all we can say. My Lord and my God. Another wise American philosopher said this. That's all I have to say about that. Amen.